When Mr. Thomas Eric Duncan first came into the hospital, he arrived with a temperature that was tested with an elevated temperature but was sent home. On his return visit to the hospital, he was brought in by ambulance under suspicion from among his family, Patty Bola. Mr. Duncan was left for several hours not in isolation in an area where other patients were present. Subsequently, a nurse supervisor arrived and demanded that he be moved to an isolation unit, yet faced resistance from other hospital authorities. Lab specimens from Mr. Duncan were sent through the hospital tube system without being specifically sealed and hand delivered. The result is that the entire tube system which all the lab specimens are sent was potentially contaminated. There was no advanced preparedness on what to do with the patient. There was no protocol, there was no system. The nurses were asked to call the infectious disease department. The infectious disease department did not have clear policies to provide either. Initial nurses who interacted with Mr. Duncan wore generic gowns used in contact droplet isolation, front and back, three pairs of gloves with no taping around the wrists, surgical masks with the option of an N95 and face shields. Some supervisors said that even the N95 masks were not necessary. The gowns they were given still exposed their necks, the parts closest to their face and mouth. They also left exposed a majority of their heads and their scrubs from the knees down. Initially, they were not even given surgical booties, nor were they advised the number of pairs of gloves to wear. After they recommended that the nurses wear isolation suits, the nurses raised questions and concerns about the fact that the skin on their neck was exposed. They were told to use medical tape and had to use four to five pieces of medical tape wound around their neck that is not impermeable and has permeable seams. The nurses have expressed a lot of concern about how difficult it is to remove the tape from their necks and are uncertain whether it is being done safely. Hospital managers have assured nurses that proper equipment has been ordered, but it is not arrived yet. Nurses had to interact with Mr. Duncan with whatever protective equipment was available at the time when he had copious amounts of diarrhea and vomiting, which produces a lot of contagious fluids. Hospital officials allowed nurses who interacted with Mr. Duncan to then continue normal patient care duties, taking care of other patients, even though they had not had the proper personal protective equipment while providing care for Mr. Duncan that was later recommended by the CDC. Patients who may have been exposed were one day kept in strict isolation units the next day, they were ordered to be transferred out of strict isolation and into areas where other patients, even those with low-grade fevers who could potentially be contagious, were the protocols breached. The nurses say there were no protocols. Some hospital personnel were coming in and out of the isolation areas in the emergency department without having worn the proper protective equipment. CDC officials who were in the hospital and infectious disease personnel who have not kept the hallways clean. They are going back and forth between the isolation pod and back into the hallways that were not properly cleaned after the CDC, infectious control personnel and doctors exited those hallways after being in the isolation pods. Advanced preparation that had been done by the hospital primarily consisted of emailing us about one optional lecture or seminar on Ebola. There was no mandate for nurses to attend trainings, 
or what nurses had to do in the event of arrival of a patient with Ebola-like symptoms. This is a very large hospital. To be effective, any classes would have to be offered repeatedly, covering all times when nurses work. Instead, this was treated like hundreds of other seminars that are routinely offered to staff. There was no hands-on training on the use of personal protective equipment for Ebola. No training on the symptoms to look for. No training on what questions to ask. Even when some trainings did occur after Mr. Duncan had tested positive for Ebola, they were limited and they did not include having every nurse in the training practicing the proper way to don and doff put on and take off the appropriate personal protective equipment to assure that they would not be infected or spread an infection to anyone else. Guidelines have now been changed several times, but it is not clear what version Nina Pham had available. The hospital later said that their guidelines had changed and that the nurses needed to adhere to them. What has caused confusion is that the guidelines were constantly changing. It is later asked which guidelines should be followed. The message to the nurses was, it's up to you. It is not up to the nurses to be setting the policy, the nurses say, in face of a virulent disease. They needed to be trained optimally and correctly in how to deal with Ebola and the proper PPE doffing, as well as how to dispose of the waste. Nurses have been asked to volunteer regardless of their training or if they have ever been trained at all. They are still only given protective equipment that left their necks exposed. They force supplies that they were still unable to weeks after the Ebola crisis at the hospital. They asked for supplies and they're still unavailable after the Ebola crisis has begun. Nurses have been left to train each other Nurses have substantial concern that these conditions may very well lead to further infections of other nurses and patients.